Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello, it's the time of year for storytelling, tales in the darkness, and not only religious ones either. Later on, we're going to be talking about two of the most influential storytellers of the past century. One still fashionable, the other decidedly not. Jane Haynes is a psychotherapist who's explaining what's so great about Proust. And David Aronovich is the Times writer who's been investigating the rise and fall in the reputation of Sigmund Freud for Radio 4. First, though, we're going to be talking about dance. We're well into nutcracker madness now, of course, but Jennifer Homans, a dancer herself, has written a huge and gripping history of ballet, from the early dancing kings to Soviet propaganda and right up to today. But we're going to start with one of our best-known choreographers whose nutcracker made it to mainstream telly and whose male version of Swan Lake made him famous. Matthew Bourne's production of Prokofiev's Cinderella, now at Sadler's Wells, is set in the London Blitz of 1940. It's a deliberately dark and indeed gory setting for a ballet most people think of as a slightly sugary fable. It's true, yes. It's, Prokofiev wrote this piece as a, a fairy tale ballet, I guess, in the style of Tchaikovsky when he wrote it, as his, as his guideline. And um, that's the way it's usually performed. And when I approach anything that I do, I have to find a way of approaching it that that is different, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't come from the classical ballet background. Um, so I have to find my way of doing it. And with this score, which I fell in love with, watching the Ashton version, actually, at Covent Garden, I loved the score. And I thought, I, I read, when I, uh, I read that it was written during the Second World War, um, in my research, I thought, I wonder if that's in the music. I wonder mm. if that feeling is there. And I listened to it with those ears, um, and it, I really felt it was. It started to sound like a film score of time. It started to... I could he almost hear the bombs dropping. I could hear uh, the uh, the idea of escapism within the music. But it has got its darker edge, as Prokofiev always does. He can't help it. Yeah, and thanks to Jennifer's book, which we'll be talking about later on, we, we know that not only was it written in perm during the war, but mm -hmm. actually it was performed as a sort of Stalinist fable, mm -hmm. uh, where Cinderella is the Soviet state or the Red Army uh, confronting and taking over the evil sisters, uh, the, who are um, the ugly sisters who are sort of capitalism and fascism, I suppose. Um, you, you present it in a very filmic way. If you're sitting in, mm. in Sadler's Wells watching this production, um, you see film, uh, the title sequence comes up, um, and it's, it, it's almost as if you have to show ballet through film. Well, I guess I'm very conscious of audiences that, I'm, uh, that my company's performing to these days and, and the kind of what they're used to. And I, I'm, I don't know... Um, I think I've always felt that way. I started off loving movies, and mm. then I, I got into dance very late. So I I feel that um, I'm very conscious of audiences sitting there and giving them as much knowledge as possible, because I feel there's a lot of people who come to dance, or my productions anyway, who who are giving it a chance. Yeah. It's not yeah. normally what they would go and see. Yeah. And I feel they need a lot of context, and I also feel that I need to explain a lot. And, and talking about the sound and Prokofiev's mm. score... It's not a live orchestra at your place. It's and no. why is that? Because some people are slightly offended by that. I think aren't they, they. Well, some people will be as a reflex action. I think uh -huh. generally, and I, I understand that. Um, this is an it's an artistic decision in a way. I, I th it, to create a filmic sound like as if you were going to see a big blockbuster movie. So it's it is surround of, sound. It's you surround get... sound. It has sound effects built into it. Um, some people hearing this might be sort of horrified by the, the thought of it, but come and give it a go, because I, I think it really works. Mm. I'm, I'm thrilled that it's working as well as it is. The central um, moment, as it were, um, in the opera is a very famous massacre at the Café de Paris, which is still open as a nightclub and actually mm. still recognisable. It's interesting. Mm. If you, you can go there, lots of kids go there and dance the night away, even now. Yeah. But 1940, there's a band there. It's full of people. Yeah. And it, it's, it gets a direct hit. Yes, and that was the the, the central story from the Blitz that, that I felt would work for this for Cinderella because it's a dance hall, it's a, a ball in a sense. And we actually depict this incident. The it's the second act, which is the ball scene, starts with a bombed ballroom that kind of comes back to life, and so it's a little ghostly feeling to it. Um, 
And I thought that was wonderful. It's a wonderful, wonderful image to work with for this piece. And um, also worked for Prokofiev as well, I felt. The music is, is sort of very muscular and at times grating and hard and, and, and a slight yeah. acid edge to it. And in this production, you have, I think, the nastiest family or kind of group of people <laughs> I've ever seen. Some genuinely creepy and offensive people, including, as we said, a shoe fetishist who appear yes. in the middle of all of this. It's, yes. it's not sugary, is it? No. Um, well, I, I decided to expand the family. She has three stepbrothers and two ugly sisters, two <laughs> stepsisters. So there's a lot of them. Yeah, they're vile. And... Uh, they, <laughs> um, but also, they, they, it's good for them in a way. They represent a family that are doing nothing for the war effort. And that they're, they're, you know, they're, you can bring all those elements into the story as well. There's a sort of conscientious objector and there's a, a sort mm. of, as you say, a shoe fetishist mm. who lives in pyjamas most of the time. And um, it's, it's fun to play with those characters and types. And what is the relationship between this, which I, thought, I, I think of as a ballet, really. Mm. I mean, I come along, I think I've been to the ballet. And yet it's not on point, it's not classical ballet, it's, it's, it, it's danced differently. So what's your relationship to classical ballet? Well, my personal relationship is that I, I didn't really discover ballet at all, or dance even, proper, mm. uh, you know, what you would call contem contemporary dance or ballet, until I was 19. And I, I grew up loving movies, and MGM movies, and Fred Astaire, and uh, the yeah. 60s musicals and things that I was watching. That's what I knew of dance. And very naively, uh, in when I was left school, um, I thought I need to get into a bit of self-education and go and see a few things that I'd never seen before. And I tried an opera, and I tried reading this, that, and the other. One of the things I tried was ballet, and I thought I should go and see something mm. that's famous. I'll go and see Swan Lake, you know. And uh, I, I kind of fell in love with it on first viewing, but not for the reasons that most people would have thought I wasn't thinking oh isn't it beautiful isn't it isn't it, isn't it, mm. isn't it amazing in, the, in uh, technically I thought it was eccentric I thought it was a piece of history preserved which I loved uh, I I I felt that it was a uh, it was glamorous it was it was lots of things uh, that appealed to me and um, the idea of telling a story through movement suddenly clicked with me as well um, but I was a fan before I was a practitioner yeah um, didn't start dancing until I was 22 Jennifer, we're going to, since you are now our resident expert on what is and what is not ballet, <laughs> as a result of many, many hundreds of pages of research, um, do you, do you, would you regard this as ballet? Um, I would say that you know Matthew's work falls very much within the, the, the mainstream of ballet, but in, in a slightly different way. Um, you know, throughout the history of ballet, there's been a, a tradition of people who, who come at things uh, from an angle, who who sort of strike ballet, you know, the operatic, mm. opera house tradition of ballet, um, at an angle, and and take sometimes a satirical view, the boulevard theaters, um, way, stretching way back to Moliere. Mm. Um, so I think Matthew falls into that category where you know there's a kind of uh, commentary on ballet happening within uh, a work that. Yeah. Uh, I certainly can't think of anybody else who people say, oh, I'm going to see the new Matthew Bourne, as it were. <laughs> you know, I mean, they don't see the new the, the, the Cinderella or whatever. What are the rest of us making? Well, I, I mean, certainly it's balletic. I mean, if we mm. understand a, a term called balletic, then you'd mm. have to say it was balletic. I mean, uh, leaving aside that you've now given away this plot with this wonderful production I'm going to see next week with the family. Sorry about uh, that. <laughs> no, don't worry. I, it, it, I, it justifies yet again uh, trying to see it. I, the imagination and the challenging nature of what uh, Matthew has done. I mean, the last thing almost that my father did before he died was take us to Matthew Bourne's Swan Lake. So it was a very kind of particular place for me in my memory um, and been back to see it since then. And of course it's a popularisation in the sense that you are going to get new people along to what seems sometimes like a dusty, sorry Jennifer, a dusty art form, we'll discover mm. why it's not. Um, but it is in the real kind of sense, it seems to me, in the tradition. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, not much of um, Proust's great work, which we'll be discussing later on, um, is, is about ballet, but he did call it shifting and confused gusts of memory at one point. And, it, and Proust was, a, w w was an enthusiast for dance, wasn't well, he? Well, Proust was also uh, very, very much, his focus was on, on the idea of the embodied self, embodied memory. And, of course, bad, ballet is, is an embodiment. And what I, what I particularly responded to in Matthew's uh, ballet in a kind of narrative sense, I guess, is the, 
the many levels it worked on. And being a psychologist, I'm obviously always interested in psychology and that with the Grimm's fairy tales, in a sense, you transpose the cruelty and there is real, real mm -hmm. cruelty in Grimm's fairy tales. And we're not here to discuss what the impact is on children. But you kind of took up the idea of ECT, electric convulsive therapy, uh, being given to uh, uh, one of the characters. One yeah, of the yes. characters. It it is genuine. It's grim with a double M, isn't it? It's, it's <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, of course, that was what yes. happened. In, in, the, in 1945 to 1955, people had ECT without anaesthetic. And today, I mean, unfortunately, that has carried through the cultural imagination. And today, ECT is given very differently. Mm. But again, again, with the, um, with the shoe, uh, with the um, traumatised... Uh, Prince uh, Charming. I mean, there's that terrible moment in the streets when you can either think he has got some awful uh, Freudian perversion about shoes and genitalia, or he genuinely has this remnant of his love, but he's treated as though by the people uh, along the South Bank as though he's got a hypoglycemic low. He's treated as though he's <laughs> drunk. <laughs> That's right. And, yes. you know, and this is the kind yeah. of thing you see in tubes. And then you have this amazing seen in the tube but I just love the way within ballet you brought in all these different elements to make us think Thank I know you. The, the other thing that um, that strikes me about uh, about the Cinderella is that you're working very much in the tradition of um, pantomime and this is another part of, of classical mm. ballet very much so you know where you're trying to tell a story through gesture through movements that grow out of gesture and through a kind of vocabulary that yeah. develops from pantomime. Well, I've, I've always felt very free in what I do, in the sense that it, it, I can, because I don't come from any kind of tradition, I can use uh, any form of dance and any form of storytelling, including pantomime, and as long as it's just act, pure acting, it's not even mime as such. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we should turn to the, to the origins of ballet in, in your book, Apollo's Angels, uh, Jennifer. Um, you, it, it's, it's commedia dell'arte, it, 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 there are street elements to it, um, but it starts very much, as badly as we think of it, as an aristocratic um, business. It's, a, it's about status and how you present yourself That's right. and order. I mean, ballet goes back to, it's, it really begins as a, as a court dance in the European courts, and it's an idea of nobility. Um, the symmetry, the order, the sense of grace and beauty in the body, uh, comportment, uh, in fact, it was actually an etiquette as much it, as it was an art in the beginning. So when you think of uh, you know, a, a reverence or a bow that dancers do today, still, every day, uh, at the end of a class, those are the same bows that were done to King Louis XIV. Or, um, and one of, one of the many extraordinary stories in your book is Louis XIV. So he is an absolute monarch. He's the sun king. So what does he do? He dances. He's a ballet dancer most of the time. And he dances for hours and hours and hours at a time. That's right. He was an avid dancer and uh, performed and practiced, um, especially in his, his youth, um, extensively. And, you know, this, is not, this was not just a matter of amusement or entertainment. I think he really understood that these spectacles... Uh, were a way of, of presenting his own uh, power, his control. Uh, he moved with a kind of grandeur uh, and um, authority. Mm. And he, he would get himself up as Apollo. Um, he was, yeah, he was one absolutely Yeah, one of the sunny. great moments is, is, you know, in 1653, after the disturbances of the Fronde, and he returns mm. to Paris, and um, he stars, basically, in, in a 13-hour-long production <laughs> that begins in the night and plays all the way through the night, <laughs> in which he confronts obstacles and nightmares and difficulties. And then, at dawn, as the sun is rising, he appears as yes. Apollo, the well, sun king, you know, dressed in gold with diamonds and... and um, and, and, the message and, is clear. <laughs> and so this business of dancing as part of, of sort of status and aristocracy and indeed autocracy eventually passes to Russia. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hopping over lots and lots of history here. But there's another equally uh, stunning moment when Peter the Great, Great introduces ballet, but for his soldiers. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, the connections between the military arts... And, and, and classical ballet are actually very close. You know, noble, noblemen had uh, three main occupations, writing, fighting, and dancing. 
And, mm. you know, the training that if you look at moves from fencing, mm. you'll see that there's actually mm. quite a lot of crossover uh, into, into ballet itself. And, you know, when ballet passes to Russia, it passes there as... Um, part of the Russian admiration for the French court mm. and its its desire to uh, remake uh, the East yes. in the image of the West. Now, you mentioned dueling there, and, and we know about the music. We know about Louis XIV and, indeed, classical Russian music because it's written down in notation. We are actually even know dueling moves because they're, they're drawn and you can follow them. Lots of attempts to produce a notation to preserve ballet, but it doesn't really work. So we don't absolutely know what they were doing, do we? No, that's right. I mean, there were attempts across the history to um, invent a notation, but none, uh, in fact, really took hold in a way that, you know, if a dancer today learns a ballet, uh, he or she is not given a, a score and said, you know, this is the ballet you will be performing. Ballet is passed on and always has been uh, as an oral tradition uh, person to person, mm. person to person, body to body. Um, you know, ballets are not stored in libraries or in books. They're stored in the bodies of dancers. So when um, we read about the the, the the first production of Swan Lake or whatever it might be, or even the Nutcracker um, in Moscow, we don't know. We don't know actually what it looked like. We know it looked like physically. We don't know what happened. Well, you know, there's there there are ways to. We know and we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that's probably changed, but there are also very um, sort of strict rituals and practices within the, the ballet tradition that do give you a certain uh, clarity as you as you go forward. You know, when a ballet is transmitted from one dancer to another, there's a, a really an ethic and code of obedience mm -hmm. and of absolute um, you know acceptance. And this is something that ballet is often criticized for, you know, an acceptance of the authority of the older dancer to the younger dancer, at least at that moment. It might be questioned later, but the, you know, both parties know that those steps are sacred in a way, and they are going to be passed along um, with a kind of uh, care and attention to detail. It's interesting. It's pedagogic. It's not the, it's, it's it's not express yourself ballet. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's follow these steps and learn this way, and it's tough. Oh, and pedagogic. it is rule driven. Yeah, yes, it yeah. is very much rule driven. And so I'm jumping further ahead again. But how does it happen that this aristocratic uh, art for very rich people to go and watch becomes the art of the patriotic Soviet Union? I mean, the the last thing you'd expect is that communists end up in tutus too. Yeah, this is one of the most interesting transformations of the art form um, in its history. And what really happens is, I mean, you you know, when come the revolution, uh, classical ballet is, is under attack because it, it's a court art and it is done by the aristocracy. And the idea is, you know, get rid of it. And the theater was in fact ransacked and uh, the royal insignia were, the imperial insignia were torn away. Um, Lenin was very skeptical. Uh, but by the time you get Stalin in power, classical ballet is, is a, becoming mm. a pillar of the Soviet state. Now, what he's happens? a conservative old son. Well, so that's, well really, that's part of it. Well, that's part of your point. I mean, in a way, <laughs> and, and, Andrew, what you said, I'm sorry to mm -hmm. interpolate, but what you, what you kind of ask is how did something which is structurally authoritarian, which is rules-based, which is passed on by the, by the cadre, to the younger man, how did that manage the transition from Tsarism to Stalinism? And the answer would seem to be, in all its components, well, that would be fairly easy. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, there is that. I mean, there is the conservative element in the in the Stalinist court, if you will. Um, but there's also another aspect that I think is quite interesting, which is that is that the the idea behind ballet, even in its most aristocratic forms, is that it's an elevation, it's an aspiration to a kind of uh, ideal man, an, an ideal man, exactly. Mm, woman, yeah. And so the 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 transition to a, a, a Soviet ideology is mm. actually not that hard to make. Mm. I mean, you're moving towards a paradise. You're trying to build in, a in paradise right, Jack, on in Earth. Right, Jack, the the a movie of the late fifties with Peter Sellers, where he plays a Bolshevik shop steward. He talks about Russia and he. Says, says, all them cornfields and ballet in the evening. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. That was the aspiration, that the ballet would be good enough for the working classes, it would be for the working classes, and therefore taken over. I found what you said fascinating. And uh, just before we sort of, we, we, we're fully up, uh, one, one further hop, we should say Prokofiev actually got the Stalin Prize, I learned from your book, for, 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 for his class. Cinderella. First mm -hmm. class. 
and, and, <laughs> and uh, Stalin loved it. Um, but Britain or England in particular has its ballet moment very strongly after the Second World War, doesn't it, with Frederick Ashton, when suddenly, it, or, you know, perhaps against all expectations, um, you know, battered old bomb hit London becomes the global centre for ballet. Yes, that's right. And, um, you know, this is one of the reasons I was very uh, moved by the, the scenes and the blitz in, in Matthew Cinderella, because the war, in fact, was a crucial turning point for the history of ballet in Britain. Um, you know, the, the, the Sadler's Wells Company at the time momentarily disbanded, but then came together in a kind of ragtag uh, company, and they performed through the bombs, uh, stuck their ground in London. Fontaine was a, a kind of heroic figure, and there was, mm. you know, on the at the base of the theater, there was a, a sign at the footlights that said, you know, air raid warning, and then it would say, you know, alert over, and they would light it up at each point, but the dancers just kept going. Mm. They didn't take cover, uh, you know, and so you get this sort of the image of Fontaine as this this figure who's, who's holding together everything that's great about... British character at the but, time. But, but now you would say, very sadly, it's a dying art. Well, what I would say is that we're in a moment of some uncertainty and crisis. Um, you know, at the heart of this art form, I think people don't quite know uh, whether there's a place in our culture today, you know, for an art form that is that values symmetry, order, comportment, manners. Um, Jane, that's something Jane I wanted to say to you, Jennifer, um, because I very much agree with you in your book about the focus on Apollo, but uh, it occurs to me, and I did look in your index, and there's nothing about Dionysus. And, of course, Dionysus was also, he wasn't a, the god of dance, but his monides, they certainly knew how to dance in frenzied form. And, of course, I think that's one of the things about Matthew's uh, construct on ballet, that there is a sense of Dionysus, and for me, uh, you know, ballet worked best, I'm afraid, with Nureyev and Baryshnikov, because they were on the edge, they were elevated, they were flying, they were amazing to look at, but there was something dangerous, and when we shut Dionysus out of our lives, or out of our cultural forms, uh, we are in danger of repression and dying, and so I was interested that you didn't bring Dionysus into your... You know, I don't think Dionysus is missing, perhaps in name, yes. But, you know, the, the idea really uh, behind ballet is that in order to get to Dionysus, you have to go through Apollo. You have to have the forms and the rigor and the training uh, that allow you then to have to freedom, to have tremendous freedom, isn't, isn't and the to be on the, the edge. The Dionysic you know? dance is, is, is about yourself. It's about freeing yourself and going to a different place, whereas classical ballet is a performance for other people. You know, um, you're, you're, you are presenting something to I don't want to answer that. I want to let Matthew answer okay. it. I can see his eyes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> uh, um, the, Dionys the Dionysiac... Mm. Hmm. I'm going to leave the question. To mm. be honest with you, I think I think we're we're going to leave it leave it hanging there for a moment, and we're going to move on to to, to Jane Haynes and Proust because there are so many connections here. Proust, him, we were talking about um, uh, Diaghilev and 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 and, and well, Nureyev and 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 the, the, the tradition that goes back to the Ballet Russe, um, who are I suppose the most Dionysiac dancers um, in, in the modern world and one of the people who was obsessed by them was Marcel Proust the great French novelist who sat there and, and, and loved the ballet and, and wrote about the ballet in his book, his great book um, and you're discussing with Margaret Drabble and, and others uh, later on this week what's so great about Proust now Proust is very very um, much loved by some people, a uh, difficult but enormous uh, figure in, in the history of the novel why would somebody who's a psychotherapist turn to Proust? Well, I never expected um, I was going to turn to Proust, and I think one of the responsibilities of being a psychotherapist is never quite knowing where you're going to turn to next. You need to always be, uh, Diaghilev said to Cocteau, astonish me, and uh, I think one of the things a psychotherapist needs to do is be constantly astonished by human behaviour. So I didn't expect to find myself reading Proust. And in fact, when the uh, Royal Society of Literature said, would you come and talk about why Proust is, and this is in, linked up with the European Union, this event, why is Proust uh, still so incredibly important? 
uh, I was taken aback because I know he's very important in, in literary and university circles. But amongst my own friends, I don't hear people talking about Proust. He's often a conversation stopper. And for many, many years, I actually thought there was this ghastly club, sort of the club of the Madeleine, which belonged to a lot of rather dreary, boring men who would mm. get into corners and discuss... I'm almost a founder member, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you're not dreary or boring. Oh, absolutely, yeah, I am. You know, yeah. they'd stand in corners and discuss the introduction and which edition to That's read. That's right, yes. And I just didn't want to know about that. I, I, um, I was very, very lucky to be introduced to the, um, the New Penguin edition, uh, which is edited by Christopher Prendergast mm. and has every book is written by a different uh, interpreter. A yeah, translator. translator. It's very I, good, actually. Which is yeah. wonderful, yeah. absolutely. And Ian Patterson, who actually wrote um, the translated volume six, is speaking at the Royal Society of Literature. Uh, why is Proust important to me? Uh, well, I think it's extraordinary. You know, he was born in 1878, died in 1922, I think. Uh, if you think that Freud published The Interpretation of Dreams in 1900, Jung was also writing, there is no indication that Proust, and Proust is very generous, unlike Freud and Jung, who never tell us where their references come from and who invariably borrow like mad. You know, um, Hazlitt was writing about the unconscious, Coleridge was writing about the unconscious, Montaigne. They weren't calling it uh, the mm. ego, the superego and the id. And again, uh, relating to David, you know, I'm, I'm amazed today if you ask people, you know, if I happen, even though I'm not a, a Freudian, to use a word like superego to a patient, they look at me blankly. They don't know. People don't know anymore uh, what the superego is. It, it doesn't uh, hang on. Is it simply that um, Proust spent so much of his life thinking about the state of being alive, what it meant to have consciousness, and observing himself and his own reactions and his own way of thinking, and, and, and looking as intently into a kind of mental mirror as it's possible to look. I think that's absolutely true. And I think as a therapist, it's very important because he used many different prisms. He saw the self. He was very modern in that sense. I'd say he was more modern than either. Well, Freud, certainly. I mean, Jung did have the much greater sense of self. But for Proust, there is no one self. There are these confessions of the flesh. There are these constant slippages where someone who thinks they are somebody discovers themselves doing something else. And he was very much influenced by the Arabian Nights, which is the most astonishing compedium of mm. human sexuality, human clay, human uh, aberrations. And Proust, you know... He's he, constantly finding himself thinking that he's thinking about something and then realising he's made a mistake. I mean, it, again, we will, we'll talk about a Freudian slip later on or Freudianism later on, but there's something deep in Proust which is about those constant mistakes. Constant mistakes, and he says, you know, at the end in volume six, which is the most extraordinary book, but he says, don't worry if you can't remember. First of all, everyone reads me in their own way. You read through your own subjectivity, which is a very modern idea. You read through yourself. You, you're not reading me. And then he says, people complain that I'm using a microscope, that I'm always dissecting, I'm always analysing, which, of course, is what we... As therapists, you know, we conduct these autopsies on the self, but he's a wonderful kind of supervisor because he's saying, no, I don't just use a microscope, I also use a telescope. I'm looking through perspectives, and he's fascinated by perspectives, perspectives of time, perspectives of vision, horizons of the sea, the way the, uh, the larks fly, and, you know, he, he opens up things rather than shutting mm. them down. Well, he's... I love this sense that every time... He, he understands that every time you read his book, you're reading a different book. Yes, and, and I, I find that wonderful because, you know, although as a therapist I have to use very precise memory, and in some ways the kind of memory I use in the consulting room is like the notation of dance because patients get very upset if you don't remember. But as far as my patients go, I'm doing something much more Proustian. I'm saying it really doesn't, rem it doesn't matter if you remember things correctly. There is no correct memory. Your memory has become embodied. So, to be precise about this, reading Proust, you believe, helps you cure or help... I don't like the word cure, Andrew. No, I know, I knew you... The minute I said it, she said, I do not like the word cure. Help, aid, whatever you do, people. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what it is that I do. I have a conversation with people which very much comes from Adam mm. Phillips. If I've been flu influenced by anything, uh, I mean, I've been influenced by many, many things. That sounds very modest and deeply by Proust. But I feel that people come to me to have a conversation 
mm. a particular conversation they actually couldn't have anywhere else. Yeah. Well, do you get all these books these days, How Proust Can Change Your Life? You know, a hundred, hundred ways in which you can Proustify yourself, which is not, I think, most people's idea of... As a therapist, <laughs> Proust can change your life and make it much more enjoyable. Which is quite interesting, isn't it? Because the word Proust is perilously close to the word priest... Um, uh, and if you kind of imagine that it holds some kind of secret uh, way of unlocking um, your life and so on, and, and, and of course, the, 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 the great thing about it is it not is the kind of minutiae. It is the idea that in small things which you might d decide not to consider actually lie quite a lot of the answers to the way in which we feel about things and the way in which memory, even if it's, um, uh, if it's unreliable, uh, tells you something about the things that you feel. Absolutely. Things greater are and less contained, and you can go back again to the ballet that we saw, and uh, when you come in, you're confronted with this um, huge uh, blow-up of a, a most beautiful shoe, and I don't know if I can pronounce, because I've never said it, let alone looked at his shoes, but Manolo Blahik. <laughs> Have I got it Very right? good one. Well, good, good go. <laughs> well but the, Jimmy, but, Jimmy Chew is easier to say. Uh, but Matthew's shoe, it straight away strikes you. I don't think you've seen... Have you seen the production? I haven't yet. No. Maybe. But this shoe is not a fairy tale slipper. It no. is very much an object which if we were using a Freudian prism with which to look at it, we might say, yes, it contains female genitals, but it could also contain all sorts of other mysteries and uh, different kinds of things. And I think that's one of the very interesting things in your programme, David, that you have um, edited, uh, presented, is the idea that uh, is symbolism not meaningful now if we actually see everything you yeah. know, up front? Uh, well, we, I, I think we might as well move straight on to Freud because the conversation's taking us that way anyway. Um, and you, you've called your radio programmes Freudian slippage. <laughs> and you're looking at Freud... I mean, we've been talking about Proust as a, as a crucial figure in the 20th century, still very influential. Um, 50 years ago, um, everyone would have said Freud is one of the great historic figures who is going to change... He's changing civilization, changing the way we all think. And... The fall in his reputation has been extraordinarily fast. It's quite interesting. I mean, what, what the programmes are really about is Freud as fashion. Uh, and it is absolutely true to say that there was a period of Freudian fashion when the notion of Freud, whether or not they directly came from him or whether they were, if you like, a kind of vulgarisation of what Freud was, was on everybody's lips. And it was kind of used. It was used, um, as Jennifer's book suggests, in ballet. Um, it was used in theatre. It was used in film. It was used in advertising. It was used by government and so on. And that moment passed. Uh, it is no longer there and it is no longer true. Now, that doesn't mean to say, of course, that some of the concepts that Freud was most famous for haven't entered into the culture in a very big way. He's moved from being this fantastic sort of 20th century guru to being an adjective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's not to say that we sort of disavow notions of the unconscious wherever they originally came from. They are very mm. important. Um, but there were these several kind of moments. And um, I, I, I think that the point was made, and it's true, that during a period where you weren't allowed to directly attack notions of sexuality, you weren't actually allowed to depict sex. Let's be, mm -hmm. clear, let's be clear about this. An awful lot of symbolism was used in culture which was meant to represent, if you like, the repressed unconscious, which was a significant mm. part of Freud's idea. And therefore you would attach the notion of Freud, Freud to it in order to give it a kind of scientific quality, in order to kind of explore things that by the time you got through the 60s and 70s you no longer needed to explore because, in some ways, because you depicted them directly. Mm. Uh, you get this very funny situation in Women in Love, the, 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 the movie, Ken Russell movie, where you both get the symbolism, in other words, the squelchy mud and the people kind of running mm. through the forest, etc. This is being at one with, with with nature. Actually, D. H. Lawrence's notion of the Dionysian, mm -hmm. which he would have opposed exactly to, and to, which to Freud's which, Apollonian, wouldn't yes. he? Uh, and, which seems terribly naive now. It's it seems terribly innocent, naive, but in the same film, mm. you can see everything. Mm. Uh, mm. And this marks the kind mm. of crossover point where you no longer need, if you like, the symbols because you've got the thing. Mm. But don't you love the the, the fig eating scene? I mean. I, it, it would be a loss for that not to be there. It would. Uh, uh, in uh, Women in Love, we're mm, talking about. Mm, yeah. Sure. Yeah. It, it would, but that, gives you, that, that reminds you that one of the things, actually, that you still can't easily depict in movies is cunnilingus. Mm. Mm. So the fig-eating thing still stands in for something that you yeah. can no longer actually yeah. see. Well, Thank goodness. Yes. Thank goodness some of us will say. <laughs> but but, 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 but just, just going back to where we started, 
Um, one of the areas where we don't we don't discuss Freud's influence, but I think Freud's influence must have been there, would be ballet. I Absolutely. mean, particularly after the Second World War. Absolutely. There, a lot of choreographers were very interested in in trying to express um, feelings that, that and often it did mean sex, you know, that were... Uh, not expressed before, and so you you know you got especially in the work, for example, of, of Anthony Tudor. Mm. Mm. You know, ba- ballets. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of a ballet called Lilac Garden, in which um, you have a, a party of a of, two, of a couple that's getting mm. married, and in, at the party are the former lovers of each mm. of the couple, and the idea is to to tr- he wants to sort of show you what the, the the unconscious feelings of this couple are in the context of this party, not through acting or, you know, some kind of pantomime demonstration, but through a a kind of almost subliminal expression Mm. of the unconscious. What what I felt very strongly listening to David's programs was that there was a generational aspect to this too, that Freud was used by a whole bunch of people in the 50s and 60s as a way of sort of pointing a finger at the previous generation saying we understand you better than you understand yourselves. Uh, you, you think you're the authority. We, are, we, we know what's really going on. Well, yes. I mean, it was, a kind of, it, was, it was the kind of notion of repression. Um, there was a f- famous film in 1945 called The Seventh Veil in which you get Herbert Lom as this sort of uh, mysterious but rather wonderful Central European doctor figure who discovers through hypnosis exactly what is wrong with this woman patient and in, in so doing discovers the thing that she really wants, the person she really wants to go to, which in this case happens to be her guardian, James Mason. And it is this kind of aspect of, of magic... We now see something. We now have the capacity to see something and unlock something that you would have repressed before. Now, this is also very important because we also we know, obviously, now with hindsight, that this completely corresponds to the change in sexual mores and indeed mm. uh, a, a bit gender per, uh, power relations that is going on in that period. It's the necess- necessary opening up in that period. So Freudism, in a way, is used. And it's not just used in film. There's, there's advertising as well. I mean, the, the whole fashion for the use of Freud in advertising, the notion of unlocking people's secret desires for them uh, and, mm. se- and uh, as a consequence, being so sell them that, products. You know, that's one of the terrible things, and you focus on English advertising, and, of course, it was Freud's nephew or cousin, Bernays, who went to America. And if we take up Mad Men, which has become a kind of cultural icon, and all these women are smoking in their bed, they're smoking over their babies, oh. they're breastfeeding, this is absolutely as a result of the unconscious kind of idea that in order to empower women, make them feel phallic, and the research that Bernays did. And that, of course, is a very negative uh, use in the sense of unconscious uh, Mm. manipulation. But one of the fascinating things, I think, about Mad Men in relation to what you've just been saying is that, um, and again, you know, Proust says, looking at things won't help us. We have to look into things. We have to look beyond things. So even when we're given a very direct sexual scene, that may not really tell us about human sexuality. And with Don Draper, I find it much more fascinating, although he's not my kind of man, actually. (laughs) He's too macho, but I find it fascinating. He undoes his zip, and you never see what's going to come out. Right. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not quite sure where we go from there. Um, yeah, over to you, Jim Nocky. Over to you, Jim Nocky. No, I think um, the other. Well, the the other thing I did want to ask you about um, the reputation of Freud. A few years ago, um, there was an attempt to kind of uh, re-establish Karl Marx um, uh, not, and say, OK, well, he thought he was a sort of economic scientist. He thought he was refashioning the world. Actually, we should think about him more as a great Victorian novelist. He's a storyteller. And the same thing's going on with Freud, isn't it? I mean, Freud, Freud who thought of himself as some kind of scientist, is now being redefined as an artist of some kind. No, absolutely. I mean, it's gradually understood that we can't provide, if you like, a kind of scientific way of testing whether or not the unconscious really is split into the ego, the superego and the id. How would you actually do that? So these concepts that were thought to be scientific no longer are. And, and neuroscience is moving in. He was in trained in neurologists. And one of the points that, uh, that, that Jonathan Miller would be keen to, would be keen to make uh, 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 is that as we 
as we become much more sophisticated in neuroscience and we actually begin to locate the areas of the brain responsible for this, that and the other. I mean, it's, mm. it, it's a work in progress. We may discover relations. We might actually be able to test some of these theories in a way that we haven't been up until now. So your point, Andrew, about, if you like, the kind of description of a story, the construction of a series of stories about ourselves which seem to be useful but sometimes seem to be more useful than they are at other times, just like Marx, mm. just like Marx in the context, if you like, of the 2008 collapse, or in the context of Marx's analysis of the incredible dynamism of capitalism, I think is right. Mm. Mm. You see, I think if Freud had published an interpretation of dreams, not the interpretation of dreams, it would be very different. Yeah. All right, I think we have run out of time finally. Thank you to all my guests. Jane Haynes, who we were just hearing there, is going to be taking part in the discussion What's So Great About Proust at the Royal Society of Literature in London on Thursday night. Freudian Slippage, presented by David Aronovich, starts on Radio 4 next Monday. Jennifer Homan's Apollo's Angels, A History of Ballet, is out now, and Matthew Bourne's Cinderella is on at the Sadler's Wells Theatre. Next week, we have opera. We have physics. We have the baby Jesus. We have Semyon Bishkov. Uh, Mark Medovic, Nick, I can't say, Medovnik, Tony Jordan and Susan Hill, whose name I certainly can pronounce. But for now, thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>